Scientific Inquiry and History There are many different processes, but a representative one is detailed on this slide and the next. First, make an observation that is objective, and here's the key point. It can be duplicated by other scientists. Gather and evaluate information about the observation. Then, make an educated guess, otherwise known as a hypothesis, to explain the cause of the observation and the reason you want other scientists to know about this, it must be tested, and not just by you, but by other scientists. Then, conduct an experiment to test the hypothesis, analyze the data, and report if the hypothesis was supported, and, of course, share the data with others. Then, and this is a key point also, it's not enough just to do the experiment and show something, you now would like to make new predictions based on your data analysis. The words theory and law have specific meanings in science. A theory explains why many types of physical events occur. Here's the key part about theories. They have been repeatedly tested by many researchers and found to be valid. So perhaps someone might tell you, I have a theory that the moon is hollow, that's why it floats above the earth. You can use that in general conversation, but in science that is nowhere near a theory because it has not been tested and it has not been found valid. You just can't say, I have a theory in science. You actually have to meet some pretty high criteria for it to be a theory, such as the theory of relativity that's been tested over and over again and found to be true. A law is slightly different, and it is not necessary for a theory to become a law. It can stay by itself. A law describes physical events and cause and effect relationships. Scientific laws make no claim as to why the events behave as they do, they just do. Like a theory, it has been repeatedly tested and found to be valid. An example would be Newton's law of gravitation. Scientific knowledge is based on questions that can be answered by experiment, detailed observations, or calculations. The knowledge should lead to models, and it's another word for theories and laws, which are then used to make predictions about related phenomena not observed yet. If the predictions fail based on your new theories or laws, then the models must be modified to fit the new results. The best models unify different, previously separate observations. For example, electromagnetic theory combined principles of electricity and magnetism. However, scientific knowledge is always subject to change as more complete experiments or observations are made, as when Einstein's special theory of relativity modified Newton's three laws for objects moving near the speed of light. It didn't throw them out, it just said under certain conditions, this works better than the three laws. Here's a quick tour through some chemistry principles and historical figures. Let's go back to the 17th century when Boyle created a gas law stated that the pressure of an ideal gas is inversely proportional to its volume at a constant temperature. 18th century, Lavoisier proposed the law of the conservation of mass. Then Coulomb quantified the force between charged particles at rest. 19th century, Avogadro, he calculated the number of molecules in a one gram mole sample of a pure substance. And that would be this absolutely huge number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Dalton created the atomic theory, which is all substances are made up of indivisible atoms and all atoms of a substance are identical. Then Gay-Lussac identified the chemical makeup of water, two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. 19th century, Mendeleev created the periodic table, which was then finished by Henry Moseley, who determined that it should be in the order of protons, not atomic mass. Then Kelvin quantified the concept of absolute zero, and Boltzmann observed the distribution of molecular velocities in the gas phase. And wrapping up the 19th century, Arrhenius developed an ion theory to explain conductivity and electrolytes, and then Le Chatelier wrote his principle, which explained the response of dynamic chemical equilibria to external stresses. Thompson, Millikan, and Fletcher 
discovered the electron, well that would be Thomson, and then measured the electron charge, Millikan and Fletcher. The Niels Bohr identified that energy levels of electrons are discrete and they reside in stable orbits around the nucleus and can jump between energy levels. Rutherford proved that nearly the total mass of an atom is concentrated in the nucleus, and then Lewis developed the electron pair concept of acids and bases. Science and technology have brought many benefits and many risks to society and the environment. Sometimes both arise from the same technology. Decisions on the trade-offs between the benefits and risks have to be constantly made. Examples of the opportunities and problems being studied by chemists follow. Nanotechnology, repairing damaged human tissue, improving the efficiency of solar energy production, and delivering drugs to certain cells. Chemistry shows how two drugs interact with one another inside the human body, playing a vital role in pharmacology and the synthesis of different drugs, pharmaceuticals. Acid rain happens due to a chemical reaction that occurs when compounds such as sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides are released into the air. In medical imaging, nuclear magnetic resonance happens when the nuclei of atoms within the body begin vibrating when under the influence of radio waves, which is a technique used in the medical field to detect tumors in soft tissue. Air pollution occurs when particulates, harmful gases, or biological molecules are released into the atmosphere. Water pollution, foreign objects and chemicals enter the aquatic ecosystem. The greenhouse effect, right? global warming, climate change, etc. That's a process where radiation from Earth's atmosphere warms its surface to a temperature above what it normally would be. Halogen radicals that are released into the atmosphere act as a catalyst in the breakdown of ozone, causing ozone layer depletion. Then chemical recycling involves chemically reducing a polymer to its original monomer so it can be processed and made into new plastic materials. Energy use and production. First of all, the generation of usable energy in great quantities for society was a major achievement of the 19th and 20th centuries, but it had drawbacks as well. First of all, we're going to divide our energy resources into renewable, which is hydropower, geothermal, biomass, wind and solar, and non-renewable, oil, gas, coal, and uranium. All have an impact on the environment in different amounts. For example, hydropower is very clean. This is damming up rivers and having the water flow over a spillway and driving turbine generators. But in some cases, communities are moved to make way for a dam. Wind and solar are mostly clean, but both are not consistently available. Burning coal, oil, and gas cause air pollution and increase levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but they are reliable and efficient. And finally, the transportation of fuels can be risky, and the waste from each process needs to be managed. Chemistry is deeply involved in your daily life. Let's start with water purification. Undesired compounds and contaminants are removed from water through various chemical processes, such as chlorination, ozonation, and chemical neutralization. Soaps are a salt compound of fatty acids. They are able to clean due to their molecular structure, which allows for them to emulsify or disperse water insoluble materials like dirt and oil. And finally, plastics. They're created by a combination of various atoms, which are combined by chemical bonds into a chain or a network through a process called polymerization, resulting in polymers. And we keep going. Batteries made up of one or more electrochemical cells which store chemical energy to be converted at a later time into electrical energy, electric cars for example. Fuel cells are devices that convert the chemical energy from fuel into electricity through a chemical reaction with an oxidizing agent. And then sodium bicarbonate, also known as baking soda. That's used to help different baked goods rise when in the oven. This happens due to a chemical reaction that produces carbon dioxide. 